So welcome everybody to panel A, Hacking Food Narratives. And uh, we are back here at the conference. And um, yeah, the public thinks of food as the products coming from plants and animals, bought in the supermarket and cooked in the kitchen. We rarely think about the role of microorganisms, yeasts, bacteria, viruses in producing the food, drink, tastes, and textures of what we eat every day. Yet, these have always been a part of food production, often, especially in fermentation, not only the production of alcohol, but cheeses, kimchi, kombucha, sauerkraut, you name it. These microbial processes have also, also been connected with collective or community interaction. And of course, all this is vital to our metabolism, both on an individual and a communal level. This communal process was ignored or neglected in the modern era. But just as we are rediscovering our own microbiome, we are recovering um, knowledges of these special spirits that inhabit our food and drink. So the artists we have here today will talk about and challenge the narratives Western society has created around food. And I'm very, very happy to uh, present our first speakers, um, artists involved in our exhibition, Hackers Makers Thinkers, the Rice Brewing Sisters Club, with Alithea Huyun Yin Shin and Hui Min Son and So Yun Liu. Uh, you have combined artistic research uh, with practice through a framework of social fermentation. Um, your practice of social fermentation has been hopping between fields of visual art, performance, creative writing, oral history, the colonial histories, as already said, geographical, geological observations, and anti-wisdom. In this presentation, you will detail our approaches to social fermentations as both a form and a method by bringing together the past projects, observations, and conservations and actions. Thank you so much for being here. So hello, everyone. <laughs> um, we're very happy to open up this Hackers, Maker, Hackers Makers Thinkers Symposium. Um, we are a Rice Spring Sisters Club, a club artist and practitioner who have been working with the social fermentation yeah. uh, since our founding uh, in 2008. Uh, I am Hemin Son. I am So Yun Liu. Nice to meet you all. Alethea Hyunjin Shin. So three of us at the moment actively working in this club. And in this short talk, uh, we will first spend some time introducing how we have been conceiving social fermentation as a concept, as a method, as a form. And also we will spend the rest of the time with some reflection about um, the time we've been here in Berlin so far, uh, especially about our project, uh, Terrestrial Celestial, Celestial has emerged. Uh, it is an ongoing project and still in um, gestation we will provide some episodic accounts through the lens of Sokko uh, Dungdung, which is a descriptive word that we think nicely put together um, as artistic social process and also um, how social fermentation functions in this artwork. So what is social fermentation? You will be very wondering. Um, we're thinking of this uh, social fermentation, um, two words, two concepts put together, the process of fermentation and also combining with this adjective social. I'm um, gonna just go, bit. yes. So let me begin with the fermentation first. The process that we are very familiar with. Fermentation is a series of chemical metabolic processes decompose organic matter using enzymatic actions of microorganisms or bacteria to produce energy such as organic acids, gas, and alcohol, which I like most. Um, these processes have been coexisting, uh, interacting, and changing with the human beings for over 2,000 years, determining the taste and quality of almost all the food we eat here. 
When I think about uh, fermentation, uh, it reminds me of my grandma's house in Korea. There was a big pot in the corner of the house and she always kept that uh, big pot in, in the house. The pot was always covered with a blanket at the warmest corner of the floor. And it's a full of sweet and sour smell and filled with the rice and water. So it, it's fermenting there. Um, ages. So whenever the blanket was uncovered, it revealed the magical moment, such a magical moment that um, transferring from something very sticky to wonderfully fragrant. Then maybe can we take a fermentation, a process in which a substance ripens to change in the different substances over time? beyond the boundaries of food culture and imagine it as a social model, a way of life and a nourished system. Let's think of these questions with the social layer of the social fermentation. Um, firstly, can process-based fermentation and its chemical activity become an agency of recognition, especially when a substance meets a new environment? then becomes a new dimension of its substance. Secondly, is it possible that social fermentation addresses how hospitality and conviviality, in addition to the aspect of organic sharing and fermentation, can be extended to contaminate boundaries between microscopic, microscopic worlds and beyond? Lastly, can you ex explore how women's overlooked collective labor in fermentation is reframed in history, belief systems, um, and solidarity? With these questions um, in mind, I would like to ask two other sisters behind me to break down the concept of social fermentation individually and collectively. So. Um. So the concept of social fermentation for us, uh, we just kind of want to share our story. Um, the concept of fermentation for us is a metaphor and an art form and also a method. The social, social fermentation represents what each member brings to the table. And it also represents the clash of agreements, disagreements, and sometimes sparks of resonance when different worlds or beings meet. It also represents what we create and the trial and errors of us working together. Um, so far, our members comprise of, of interest of biological fermentation, anthropological research, um, and also social organizing as part of our backgrounds. Our interest contributes and takes role in our work and every project that we do. Um, so social fermentation is also a method for us. We choose to meet and we choose to do things with others. Uh, we actually partake in developing a network within ourselves and outside of ourselves. And this is partially because there are things that we don't know. And there are also things that um, we seek to understand. And this is great. Um, and artists, collectives, aunties, farmers, and scientists have been collaborators who held this experience and wisdom and insight um, through their choice of living practice and also in response to the environment they live in their given time. Um, so these are people that we want to work with and um, continue to ask for collaboration. Um, Non-human matters such as our senses, history, memories, systems, microorganisms, spirits, um, has also been active part partners in our work. And all this informs us in the making of our artistic modes of collaboration. And by doing so, I hope to say within the temporal relational space that we create in our projects, that we seek to create a safe space and time to channel and unpack the social frameworks that we encounter. And in the context of the coloniality or feminism or ecological practice, 
or the non-human or human discourse and more future conversations that are to come. Um, that we continue to do things ourselves and with, and with others to feel and know and what we might continue to explore and build um, as we continue to make work as a collective body. Thanks, Alethea. My thoughts resonate with the other two sisters, but I just wanna add a note that um, there is indeed a material specificity that uh, the, this biochemical definitions like metabolic process and the chemical changes of the organic substrates and the actions of enzymes, all of these biochemical knowledge um, do take core parts of our practice of social fermentation. But at the same time, we are also thinking about the possibility of this process to expand its biochemical boundaries. And in this sense, I think our works might even test the limits in, in a playful way, which we can think elastically between fact and national and irrational, institutional and vernacular. For instance, how elastic are the words like metabolic processes, organic changes, or enzymes in this case or in our works? These processes not only apply to the chemical knowledge of the organic matter we deal with, but also with other knowledge systems that we have thought that all of us might have thought as non-scientific and hence non-rational or even the anti-wisdoms, for example, deliver this feeling of nostalgia and mesmerization, of course, at the same time, actual rigor that we have more exclusionary rather than inclusive ways. So it is in the sense of what we call elasticity that we think of social fermentation as our core method. And by elasticity, we think about it as a method of breaking boundaries and hierarchies of value systems. And it is also in a way a political method or a belief that it is possible to create micro or macro, temporary or permanent forms of community once we break these boundaries. For one instance, dealing with social fermentation very, very often goes against the primacy of productivity or certainty that derive from our mostly anthropocentrist value systems because things take time to mature and we don't know when it's gonna mature. Um, it also involves a lot of contingencies and variances including time, climate, humidity, mood, energy, and all of these decide the right balance between the sour and the dry or the fermented and the decayed, but we don't exactly know um, how this is going to take place. So, of course, we do a lot of research, but we find that all, all of these re researches are not enough. Um, and overall, the state not knowing or not being able to know, yet knowing somehow with our bodies and feelings and senses, all of these processes determine a lot of our artistic practice. Um, so in an object that we see and exhibit at the ALB space, the object is not a finality in itself, and we're going to explain what we mean later. Um, it is rather kind of an open-ended circuit, that's how we perceive it, that continuously morph its forms and outcomes depending on where we are and who we work with, what kind of environment, um, social and climatic environment that we're in. And through this method of social fermentation, we believe that these uncertainties, uncertainties translate into a kind of elasticity. Um, lastly, I want to note that this open-endedness that social fermentation holds might turn it into a metaphor. And we actually have seen this thought from a very well-known book um, called Social uh, Fermentation as a Metaphor by Sandra Katz. But at the same time, throughout the three years that we have worked together and struggled together, we realize how fermentation, uh, when interpreted socially especially, um, is very far from being a literary device, but actually something that is very tangible and very material, even capitalistic. In other words, it is not only something that we conceptualize, but something that we do, hence doing social fermentation. And we've seen how fermentation in some cultures is directly related to lives and sustenance issues of food security and the economic sovereignty, especially through um, when seen through the feminist lens. Um, so starting from fermentation, we also end up engaging with the political economy because we consume, we make economic exchanges through it, we form interest groups, and we build industries built around fermentation. So it is our hope that our social fermentations practice can function as a method that is at once poetic, 
and materialist. And it is with this vision that we approach our project in Berlin called Terrestrial Celestial. So on that note, we're gonna move in a little bit of picture of ourselves, Barbie. Um, we're gonna move on to the second part of our talk that kind of details the process of uh, living in Berlin for a month, staying in Berlin and making work called Terrestrial Celestial and the process which we call Sokko Dung Dung. Um, so the work here, you've seen the picture already from Regina's um, beautiful articulation. And it is a process-based work that is an installation that kind of functions as a culturing home for microbiomes that we raise. But it is also kind of a platform where a lot of performative actions and conversations, workshops, and cultivation of relationships, all of these unfold. Um, and it is definitely a work that um, kind of adapts across time because um, fermentation takes time and it ferments throughout the exhibition period until July 10th. So in this, in the context of this talk, we thought it's best to kind of provide some episodic accounts um, surrounding this installation and how it came about rather than maybe giving a linear um, narrative of what this work is. So we are going to provide three episodes. Um, and I think Hemin will start us with one called So So Land. Yes, um, So So Land, um, Hook Hook Land in Korean. Um, so we're traveling back to Korea. Uh, so in 2020 was the year that um, brought or brought the three of us all together in Korea um, in the same place, which is quite rare. Um, we often kind of communicating online, also working in a very uh, short short of time or really focused time, like meeting and then working together. But that year was pandemic and uh, we sort of like uh, stuck in a Korea and then like being year whole together. So it was the, um, we were in Ansong, which was the town um, of South Korea, uh, located a little bit of South to Seoul and it's considered of the major agriculture town of the metropolitan region. So it's, um, I don't know whether we have, yeah. So we settled in a very small size of um, uh, land, I would say, yeah. And started a project called Soy Soy Land, um, Cook Cook Land, uh, was about experiencing a process of circulation uh, from germinating, growing, producing, consuming, composting, to taking and giving back to the land. So um, whole year, it was very hardcore learning for us with bare foot, bare, bare hands and feet all together for a year. And um, yes, uh, basically we are cultivating a land and uh, planting seeds and then learning different discourse from uh, different farmers and then scientists to, uh, to grow these uh, plants, which is like a native plants in uh, Ansong. So for a year, it was for us a learning process, um, very long-term learning process, uh, working with the land and soil. And then it's an opportunity to observe the soil uh, very closely, uh, which kind of learned um, for us uh, learned many other uh, farmers and knowledge holders on where and how to plant the seeds, how to uh, tell certain plants from others, how to cultivate certain plants together, how to make compost. And it lets us um, uh, pay more attention to what indigeneity, um, tojong in Korean, meant to the land we live in. So that's uh, I'm just to show through a little bit of our working process here. But this is very closely um, connected to what we have been doing in Berlin at the moment. So um, I'm gonna hand over to the second episode. Um Nuruk and Sokkotiumbi. Regina already again explained beautifully what this is, but um, so this is 
So duruk is a Korean word uh, for fermentation starter or yeast. And sokkotiyunbi is another Korean word that is a composting method using uh, what is called indigenous microorganisms or IMO. So the process of making both duruk and sokkotiyunbi is actually really similar. Uh, we would make and sculpt a ball of rice using rice flour, let me see, like this. Um, and then we would just let it sit for a little bit, um, depending on the environment surrounding us, and let the microbes attach to um, the rice balls as mediums. And throughout the past three years, we have been researching and experimenting with this method, as Hemin explained, in Sabah of Malaysia, learning from Auntie Ita how to make, um, in this case, laru or ragi. And we've been conducting workshops of actually making duruk and developing into more of a cosmic, okay, sure, thank you. Um, cosmic, more of a macro vision to fiction making and propagating memes. And here we're doing this experiment, but um, with attention to the process of how it's being made. And we call this sokkodungdung because it involves a lot of mixing actions and stirring actions. And sokko means stirring in Korean and dungdung means the action of floating. So we'll mix it together um, between different human agents, non-human agents, and let it sit, ferment for a period, and let the white microbiomes kind of attach to it over time. And then this is how the microbiomes flourish and cultured, and then we would fit in um, terracotta, which replaces um, the ongi, the Korean clay jar from, from the Turkish market, and then let it ferment over time period. And with this process of sokkodungdung, mixing, letting it float, um, we mix microbiomes coming from various soils found throughout Berlin, um, many of which soil we don't know where it's coming from because of the histories of Berlin soil, of mobility, localization, being having a lot of sand, therefore being donated soil from a lot of nonprofits and corporations. We're dealing with all these histories of mixing and floating. And we are doing this with a lot of people with migratory backgrounds um, coming from South Korea, Turkey, Mexico, many other places. So we're making this huge mix and of things that we don't know where it's coming from, where we're fermenting, experimenting, and seeing how it goes. So this process of kind of contingencies is something that we've been really enjoying here. We don't know how it's going to ferment after all. Um, we will open our first, first batch of microorganisms by the end of this week. Um, and we will make the second batch and kind of adapt the knowledge that we've learned in the past few weeks into the next generation. Okay, Elite. Alithia is going to quickly introduce the third episode. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we've been doing this experiments in uh, many community gardens throughout Berlin, um, Tempelhofefeld um, and garden colonies in Kreuzberg um, and also Neuken um, with many of the collaborators who are also here. Yeah, so that's what we've been up to. And thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rice Brewing Sisters, and we will uh, come back to your uh, amazing project uh, during the discussion, and I'd like to continue already to our next uh, wonderful speaker. We are so happy to have you here, Pei, Pei Ying Lin. I start already introducing Pei Ying. Um, so, Pei Ying Lin is an artist and designer from Taiwan and currently based in Eindhoven, the Netherlands. Her main focus is on the combination of science and human society through artistic methods and is particularly interested in building a common discussion ground for different cultural perspectives regarding elements that construct our individual perception of the world. Pei, you have won the honorary mention in hybrid arts category of Ars Electronica in 2015, also the honorary mention of Starts Prize in 2020, so many um, prizes have been um, also before been taken, given over to Pei Ying, and also there is the um, professional runner up in speculative concepts, of course, of the seven awards in 2015 or the bio art and design awards. So um, awards for an amazing array uh, of uh, projects, interdisciplinary projects in art and science. And today, Pei, you will 
or tell bring us into the world of a project that we have actually um, uh, been exhibiting at Art Laboratory Berlin, Virophilia. Thank you for being here. So thank you, Regina, for introduction and thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's actually been maybe two years that I haven't been standing in front of the people because of the pandemic. So I might be a little bit nervous. Uh, so I'm introducing the project of Virophilia here. But I will start with a little bit of uh, my trajectory or my journey with viruses. Um, I've been interested in the project uh, in viruses for a very long time. And here you see is one of the projects I did around 2011-ish. It's called smallpox syndrome. And it introduced, uh, interest me with viruses in the very beginning because a science fiction novel that was written by a Chinese author talking about smallpox being coming out again, where everyone was being affected, um, disregarding what their background is, how, what kind of economy standard they have. And then because of that, I start to study how I quite like this neutrality of viruses, that everyone is equal in front of the virus. And so I start to explore all the notions that are related with it. And the first notion was hygiene and where hygiene is connected with beauty. So um, I was studying in RCA, Royal College of uh, Arts in uh, design directions then. And we do a lot of speculative design, design fiction. So I was um, using the method of imagining um, what will happen if we play on the notion of beauty that if you're vaccinated, then you're considered more hygiene and more beautiful. So you will actually display the coat on the forehead or on the parts that you want as a makeup and it's also a vaccine at the same time. And I think I was estimating uh, around 2020, we will have a war that we've been affected by viruses so much that it becomes a big part of our life, which was fun. Um, and then in 2016, the virus, a journey continues, and this is a project that was uh, funded by the BAT Award, where I was collaborating with a virologist, uh, Miranda de Graaf. She uh, is studying um, this virus called norovirus that you probably all got it before. It makes you puke on diarrhea. And if you got infected, you get immunity for two years maximum, and then you will be affected again. The thing is, it's impossible or they haven't developed vaccines for it yet. So we propose that uh, we should try to tame them. And this notion of taming them is proposing that we need to live with them. And by living with them, uh, we don't have the ability to change the virus. So we have to change our behavior, which is a little bit funny to look at it now since for the last two years. And with all these kind of um, exploration of viruses and because of this question uh, that was situated in art makes me understand more about viruses. And I get a little bit tired about looking at viruses in the pathogenic perspective. And so I start to look for other relationship that we have with viruses. This is the image of the tulip breaking virus. And it was being very famous in the 18th century in the Netherlands because with a tulip that has this kind of irrigation, you can buy a house and it's like so expensive. It's so expensive because nobody knows. We didn't have the idea of virus then. And they didn't know why it was causing this variegation. And it turns out that after the discovery of viruses that is caused by a virus, of course, there are other breeds that is being bred that genetically uh, creating this kind of um, variegation. But then, uh, back then it's only available if it's infected by viruses. Uh, also, there are another research, another art project called Plant Sex Consultancy. I also came across another example of um, viruses making benefit. So this is a uh, abutilon mosaic virus that gives variation, uh, variegation to the plant. And it was first, uh, so abutilon originally grows in South America, if I remember correctly. Around 19th century, there is this shipment of these abutilon plants that's very different from other abutilon plants that has variegation on their leaves. And it turns out that it's a virus. 
And these plants become very popular. They have a higher price. So as a result, plant virus seems to be very interesting in the sense that uh, if we are studying human viruses, that is also always pathogenic. But with plants, because maybe it's not so anthropocentric, uh, in a way we start to view it in other possibilities. So I reached out to this virologist, um, Rene van der Vloek. He works in Bakken University on um, mostly plant viruses and specifically tobacco multivirus and other viruses. He was very friendly, uh, welcomed me to his lab, which is also a greenhouse. And so this is an image of the greenhouse. If you go in, you see lab coats, uh, just like any labs and greenhouses structure. But there's one image that caught my attention. Uh, it says, wash your hand first with soap, really hard and non-smokers. So it's a little bit weird. Why non-smokers? Because they are studying tobacco mosaic virus and tobacco mosaic virus affected tobacco. Tobacco is the thing that you make cigarette. As a result, um, occasionally you will have the leftover of the viruses on your hand if you're a smoker. So you are not allowed to enter the lab because you might be carrying the virus Another really interesting thing in the greenhouse is that we are very familiar with this thing now. It's an um, antigen test of plant viruses. And this one, I think, is Pepinomosa virus, which is something that affects uh, tomatoes. Within the space, they are growing tomatoes. So they are constantly testing if the plants are being affected by the virus. If not, that, that means it's very clean and you can do experiments in it. It was also during the conversation with him that he mentioned about 90% of the plants, of the tomato plants in the Netherlands has been affected by a virus, but it was intentionally. Uh, it's used as a vaccine. So this is one of the example. It's a vaccine that's created by uh, DCM is based on Pepinomosa virus. Um, one of the example being, this is another visit to the Lois farm. Lois is um, a farm that grows tasty tomatoes in the sense of like, to, if you look at the history of tomato growing, uh, to some point people were trying to grow them for the ease of transportation instead of focusing on the taste. So this farm, Instead, they focus on the taste and they use very high technology in growing the tomatoes. Uh, what happens is if you have a very large area growing tomatoes and because of the land is more expensive in the Netherlands, you have to control the environment to make sure that they don't catch disease. And they are also trying not to use the, um, the pesticide because it's bad for the whole um, ecosystem within the greenhouse that in the end you might actually need to spend more money to grow them. So they need to control a nice healthy ecosystem in there where they also use the um, vaccines that I just mentioned. So when the new plants come in, they will intentionally uh, inoculate the virus on the tomato. So the tomato will be already infected and they take time to adopt to the virus and they start to live with the virus. So all the tomatoes you see here has that virus. And also because um, the boss from the greenhouse mentioned that if you infect the virus uh, at the wrong time because the plant takes a while to adopt to the virus, uh, it will affect the yielding of the tomatoes. So you need to choose the right time allow enough time for them to adopt to the virus so you can have the best yield. And that's why they have a very high percentage of viruses um, in the tomatoes in the Netherlands, because we think this is the most economy way of using the virus to grow the plants. Uh, I had one small experiment performance uh, in, in Vienna and where people were trying uh, different tomatoes from different places and I provided them with an uh, antigen, antigen test and they were discussing whether the tomato is tasty or not. And it was really funny, like some people are like 
the one that has viruses more. So all these experiences brought me to this virophilia book. It first started with uh, a future scene. So I tried to position myself as the author in the future of 2068. The reason being that I have a, an allowance of uh, my imagination to imagine how the technology might uh, develop towards. So this is me as the fictional author writing, looking back at this history of how we develop new methodology of using viruses in cuisines, because that might change our mentality. And it's a uh, breakdown to five chapters that goes from around now-ish to around 40 years from now. The first chapter goes about now-ish that people start to simulate the viral experiences. Can you have a food that makes you sick? For example, you can have an influenza simulation dish or a whole dinner where you can uh, breathing the mucus arosal that hurts your throat, uh, a dog that makes your throat hurt as well, or with a lot of chili that makes your temperature heats up to experience the influenza. Uh, another one is um, you can also have the image on the right is actually norovirus, uh, where norovirus you catch it easily with eating the oyster and then you can have them a certain dressing on top of it that makes your stomach ache a little bit so you can enjoy the sickness. Uh, the second chapter is a bit more sophisticated. So we have fermentation. Fermentation usually works with bacteria because viruses is much harder that you have to grow the virus within a living host. And so I was thinking of what if that is doable? Can we ferment? Because if you got infection from the virus, also change the um, texture or the structure of your organs and tissues. So can you ferment, for example, you want uh, norovirus make intestine become more smooth. If you want more smooth intestine, can you uh, inoculate in a cow form for the cows first uh, for a week and make sure that you kill the cow when he, it is still infected by the virus? And then you make sure that it's the right kind of virus that doesn't spread to human. Would that be possible? Or taking the example of some existing viruses that makes plants be more durable to drought. Can we also use that virus to make plants more durable to drought as a uh, result, making it more sweet because it can grow in um, drier space? The third chapter is using viruses as active ingredients, sort of like we are having vaccinations, you have a fever for a day, and these are oral vaccines where you can eat it. So on the left hand side, influenza egg on rice, because most of the influenza or well, early research of influenza vaccines are grown in the chicken eggs. Uh, on the right hand side, SM Brewery, where you do the brewery yourself, but you are also inoculating the virus at the same time when you're chewing. Um, then it becomes more sophisticated. Uh, I had one visit who also contribute a lot to this project. Uh, the scientist is called Corina Bussard. She is a researcher in marine biology. And she showed me her research of how do you tell if the algae are infected by viruses? It becomes transparent. So these are transparent because the algae are dead. These are in different colors because they have different status. And that gives me the inspiration of using the virus to um, control the, um, the color or the taste of a food because you can, um, viruses are good at selecting within a soup of things, infecting only their host and not affecting others. Uh, so for this one, you can change the color because the host is reacting to the virus throughout time. And so you can have a changing color drink, for example. The last one is about uh, 40 years from now, where we start to think very differently uh, how we, uh, are within this ecosystem. So with the visit of uh, Karina Bussar's lab, she also mentioned that the strategy of algae becomes transparent by infected by the virus 
is that they will kill themselves. Um, so instead, with COVID, we are trying really hard to make sure the individual who caught COVID doesn't die from that. But for algae, because they are single cellular organisms, it's comparatively cheap for them to just kill themselves and to protect the bigger community. That makes me think about how we value life very differently within uh, different species. So I was proposing that considering different species has different value of life, we can design dishes that everybody in the food chain can enjoy, but some got completely eaten. Some of us uh, in the food chain will provide something back into the food chain instead for others to join. It's quite sophisticated. And if you have time, then maybe you can read the story in the exhibition. Um, so it's also very difficult to uh, transmit this feeling of being sick and so the project also is this in the video form where I have the actress eating the dish that has the virus it's also existing as an installation which I think the most important is the scroll behind because that's a growing list of viruses that we know uh, that has names but COVID is not even on there because it's a subgroup of uh, SARS in there and it's been around 7,000 of them when I started the project, and now it's grown to 9,000. And it's estimated maybe only 10% of all the viruses that we know. So, you know, there are a lot of possibilities. And it also exists as a demo performance. But during COVID time, we also do it with food delivery, where you can get the food, open it up, um, join the online meeting, where I tell them the story of the viruses while they're eating the food. And it also becomes a very interesting exploration because with all these dinner performances, I collaborate with different people, uh, chefs, people who are interested in cooking and develop the dishes for them. And this is the image of a collaboration I had with a tea house in Japan, which actually throughout the process, we discovered that the albino tea, the white tea, uh, a special kind, is probably also affected by the virus. And that brings a very mild, nice of taste. And we were also trying to integrate the idea of if it's being affected by virus, can we have like two different kinds of taste of the poor? Or can we have um, an alcohol contained tea as a way of sanitize ourselves? And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Pei Ying, um, for your um, fascinating presentation. And I want to move on to our third um, talk, to our third speaker, who we are absolutely mind blown to have not only in the conference, but here in person in Berlin. Uh, Oron, Oron Katz is with us here today and tomorrow in the Today Conference. And um, welcome, Oron. And uh, before his presentation, let me just quickly introduce, for those who do not know, Oron. And uh, we can say that we have here different generations of um, uh, artists um, working with uh, life, art, and uh, life. And I think Oron is a very important artist here. So just to give a general introduction, Oren Katz uh, is the co-founder and director of Symbiotica, the Center um, of Excellence in Biological Arts School of Human Sciences at the University of Western Australia, Perth. Symbiotica was awarded the inaugural Golden Nika for Hybrid Arts in the Prix Ars Electronica in 2007 and the WA Premier's Award in 2008. Together with Jonat Sur, uh, Oron founded the Tissue Culture and Art Project in 1996. Katz was a professor at large in contestable design at the Royal College for the Arts in London and a visiting scholar at the Department of Art and History, Stanford University, and a visiting professor at the School of Art, Design and Architecture at Aalto University in Helsinki, and many, many other projects and uh, evolvements. Um, we could continue the line. Um, let me also just uh, say that um, Oron curated 13 exhibitions, published, co-edited four books, published more than 80 book chapters and journal articles, and um, your work around featured an exhibition in venues such as MoMA 
in New York, Centre Pompidou, Mori Art Museum, and Science Gallery London, to only name a very, very few. So, um, Oren, the stage is yours, and you will um, tell us today a few ideas in context of nature-free agriculture, hacking, and contesting future food systems. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Regina. Thank you, Chris, and everyone else who's responsible for having me for this short visit. It's, it's was a dream of mine to come to Berlin and see what you're doing for many, many years. So it finally happened post pandemic. So it's great fun to be here. Um, I will give you some provocations. Those of you who know me know that I'm a provocateur. So, you know, you don't have to take me too seriously, but uh, hopefully you'll get some points uh, from what I have to say. Uh, but before I start, I really would like to acknowledge the Wajak people who are the traditional custodians uh, of the land from which I live and work, which is Perth, Western Australia, or the Balu on the Dabal Yarragan. Um, and I would like to acknowledge their strength and their continuing culture and pay my respect to elders past and present. And actually in the context of what I have to tell you in the context of what we heard before, this type of uh, traditional knowledge is becoming, in my opinion, more and more important, especially when we're dealing with food systems. And uh, I, I would like to acknowledge that. And I would like to acknowledge that some of the stuff I'm going to tell you today is inspired to, to a large extent from conversations I had with uh, some aunties and some traditional owners uh, in Western Australia. Um, I never thought that I'll be dealing with food systems, some I say. I, I, I grew up in a farm and that really took me off food systems from quite some time. Uh, but uh, back in the year 2000, Yonat Zuru and myself have been growing meat in the lab. And the reason why we've done that wasn't so much that we wanted to feed the world or deal with ethical issues around uh, the reduction of the use of uh, animals in food production, but because our interest was always about how our relationship to the concept and the idea of life is changing and shifting, in light of the new knowledge that we acquire through science and the new way we uh, employ this knowledge through engineering. And we realized that one cannot get more intimate with another life form than consuming it and metabolizing it and introducing it into one's own body. Yeah? So the idea of growing meat in the lab made a lot of sense for us from this perspective. The idea of what does it mean to engage with life that never been in a body? What does it mean to incorporate meat that never was part of an animal body was what drove us to grow our first piece of meat back in the year 2000 and eat our first piece of lab grown meat back in 2003. Now we have to remember that the idea of being able to use and engage with living biological materials, especially around food systems, is as um, Jonathan Safran Foer reminds us, we treat nature as an obstacle to be overcome. And, and I would claim that any attempt to work with the living biological material for human ends, be it a very romantic idea of collaborating with other organisms or the very uh, industrial notion of uh, farming, there are all degrees of violence that we exercise in our attempts to control and treat nature as an obstacle. Yeah? So it's not, it's not warm and fuzzy. It is a, a, a relationship of a adversarial relationship between us and the living world around us. And it's just the choice we have to make is the degree of violence that we're willing to exercise towards other living beings, not whether we collaborate and love them or not. Uh, provocation. Um, the idea of growing meat in the lab really exploded in the last few years. Uh, there's a growing number of companies, startup companies around the world that are promising us this future of uh, abundance without consequences. Uh, one of the main companies is a company called uh, Just Eat. And they are the first company in the world that was able to get uh, uh, governmental approval to sell lab-grown meat in Singapore a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is from the website uh, that promotes what they refer to as good meat, the product that is now being sold in Singapore. And there's something quite interesting about the way they're telling us their story. So this is, it's like one of those infinite scroll uh, websites. So you start to scroll and you see this uh, image, which is uh, basically an electron micrograph of uh, what's supposed to be meat and says, there's nothing natural about the meat we're putting into our bodies now, which I agree with. Then they have this image, which is under the animal uh, health uh, section of the website, where they say how we manufacture animals and treat them as commodities is new and unnatural. And again, this is a point that I think we all have to uh, take on board. 
But then you go down to their product and they're saying here, this is good meat, engineering a natural and innovative process to grow meat for the world. This is the new nature that they're proposing. This is the natural solution that those companies are trying to promote. Another company called Air Protein, they're claiming that they're creating meat from air. And they're talking about the fact that we need a new way of thinking about how we grow meat, how we, how we feed ourselves. And the whole proposal is that somehow magically we can generate meat from nothing, meat from air. Actually what they're doing, if you look really deep into it, they're actually using bacterial fermentation to ferment proteins. But they somehow figured out that bacteria don't really have a good uh, reputation, so they would sell us the fantasy of meat from air. Luftgeschäft, no? That's how you say in German? Yeah, that's the thing. So we decided to respond to it, one of the very latest projects that uh, Yonat Zur and myself, in collaboration with uh, Steve Barrick, uh, had in Perth uh, earlier this year, is a project which is called 3SDC, which is, stands for Sunlight, Soil, and Sheet Decycling. And the idea there is to look at the way contemporary ag tech and uh, those food systems are promising us a future where we'll live without those basic ingredients, which are sunlight, soil, and shit. Or in other words, what they call controlled environment agriculture, and we've seen a little bit uh, uh, this type of controlled environments that are being promoted as a new sustainable way of uh, providing us with food. So in our system, we basically had a compost incubator. So we designed an incubator to grow uh, animal cells, so basically lab-grown meat, but the heat was generated through a rotting process, basically a fermentation of sorts, of uh, uh, composting uh, uh, this wood chip that generated a steady temperature that allows us to grow meat in the, lab, in the farm, actually, uh, but uh, using only fragments of bodies. Um, the meat was then, and because it's a cycle, you can start everywhere you want. Uh, here you see on the side also a, a hydroponic system um, that was used to grow uh, plants that wasn't used for food, but were used to feed the compost to heat the meat that was then being processed using a, a technique which is called alkaline hydrolysis uh, that is now being promoted as a form of environmental cremation um, to produce the fertilizer to grow the plants in the hydroponic system to uh, basically for the uh, compost that was then was hitting the meats or incubating the meat cells that were then used as the uh, starting point for the alkaline hydrolysis and so it went. So it was basically a, a, a useless cycle because obviously there was nothing there for human consumption. And on top of that, we had what we refer to as the control center. Steve Berek, our collaborator, is a, an amazing artist that uh, deals with um, sensors and technology. And we basically uh, developed a range of sensors that provided us large amount of useless data. And, and just before I came here, I went to one of the most neoliberal conferences one can imagine, the DLD conference in Munich, and there was a whole panel about uh, those control um, agricultural environments. And one of the things that really struck me, and you know, we thought we we're doing a satire here about this, uh, creating shitloads of data that no one really needs, but as a way of kind of promoting this whole idea of those new technologies. And one of the speakers in this DLD conference was talking about the fact that we need to think about data as a new food ingredient. This is how fucked up things are. Yeah. So in the name of sustainability, many new food production and agricultural ventures such as vertical farming or cellular agriculture propose a system that removes natural elements from the process of production. The idea of soilless farming techniques or animal products without animals are presented as having less, or in many cases, as no impact on the environment this is something we call metabolic rift technologies. So metabolic rift technologies are a prime example of the Prometheanism uh, approach that favors extractive approaches over instructive methodologies of production. Metabolic rift technologies call for separation from nature following a very similar mindset to a, where about, where am I? Yep, following a similar mindset that leads to tech companies uh, to promote the metaverse, for example, as a nature-free site for human habitation, obscuring the environmental cost of such an existence. So what all of those technologies are doing, and this is the idea behind the metabolic rift technologies, is that we somehow 
would like to believe that we can use technology to separate human existence from nature. So not just treat nature as an obstacle to be overcome, but totally separate our, our existence for, from nature itself uh, in the name of sustainability. Uh, and by doing so, somehow uh, dig ourselves out, out of the mess we're in. Uh, but what they're actually doing, and this is what the metaverse, for example, is doing as well, is just creating this illusion that we have no impact on the world around us. It's separating us. It's obscuring, it's hiding the victims of our existence. It's not eliminating them. Yeah, so, and, and when you think about it in the context of where we are now, so in the Industrial Revolution, one of the major outcomes of that was the separation of sentiency from labor. Yeah, so the idea was to create machines that are non-sentient in order to allow us to uh, be able to produce more and more and uh, generate this industrial revolution that uh, led us to the kind of existence we have now, uh, and by basically removing biological agents, yeah, so workers, slaves, so slaves or uh, working animals, and replacing them with those non-sentient machines. Uh, in the so-called fourth industrial revolution, which is what is being promoted at the moment, and, and in many cases, actually, even the best intentions of artists that are trying to deal with those issues, we are part of that very same mindset. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution promised to bring sentiency to the machine through things like artificial intelligence. And again, conference after conference I've been to lately are talking about this idea of bringing sentiency to machines through AI and autonomous sy systems. Another panel in the DLD was about uh, the creation of, of autonomous enterprises. So basically having companies that are running by AI that have their own sentiency. So if we think about corporations as persons, now they're talking about corporations as aware sentient persons that would control us. At the very same time, we're trying to remove sentiency from biological entities through biotechnology and synthetic biology in the name of increasing productivity and efficiency. And, and this is a slide from a recent TED talk by Isha Datar, who's uh, the CEO of a company called uh, New Harvest, which is one of the biggest non-profit organizations that promote this idea of uh, uh, growing animal products without animals. And what she says there when she talks about the idea of growing chicken meat in the lab, she says rather than raising the whole chicken with those useless things like beaks and feathers and sentiency, we can just grow the muscle cells. So when we reach a situation where humans are talking about removing sentiency for biological systems for human ends, for human uh, uh, desires and wants, what kind of world we are going to live in? If we think about the major shifts in the idea of the removal of sentiency from labor with the Industrial Revolution, where it leads us, and now we're thinking about the removal of sentiency from biological systems, while at the very same time we give sentiency to non-biological systems, what kind of world we're going to live in? So as an artist, I think this is one of the most interesting questions uh, that we need to deal with. And we need to deal with uh, now. It's, it's an urgent question because those, as I said, with the combination of that and the metabolic rift technology and the metabolic rift mindset, the idea is that this is somehow promising us a solutionist approach towards the problems we're in at the very same time that it's doing nothing but hiding the real problems that we're facing. And just one little example. Um, this is a paper that was published just uh, last year by MIT engineers who were talking about the idea of being able to grow wood in the lab. So it's not just growing meat, it's growing milk in the lab. It's now also proposing to grow things like wood in the lab. And in there, they're talking about why do you need to grow the whole tree uh, that has all of those unwanted or unusable plants, parts of plants anatomy, such as bark, little twigs, roots, and leaves. So how are you going to feed it? What's going to feed those, this lab-grown meat? If you don't have leaves and roots, which are useless, like sentiency, which is useless, that we need to throw away, what kind of world we live in where people can actually seriously propose those kind of things? like the air protein, like somehow we can grow air from uh, meat from the air. So this fetish of technological approaches to life often overshadows the life, the context in which life operates itself. Yeah? Uh, we call it neolifeism. So Unite myself are, are working a lot on this idea of the fetishization of those technological approaches to life. So it seems that the biological milieu is transformed into an abstract technological instrument of control where life is just another raw material to be engineered. The contextualized life has been reconfigured, mixed and remixed, re reappropriated and instrumentalized to such an extent that the technologically imagined, and remember that this is the imagined idea about life stands for life itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oran.
um, I'd like to invite all the speakers here to the podium to have a, to start our conversation. And we have about half an hour. This is really perfect. And uh, also we try to um, later on open up the forum to questions from the audience. And actually, if we have time also to even um, come back to the questions of the online forum if we find the time. Um, so thank you very much all speakers um, uh, here of the panel, um, Hacking Food Narratives. And I see here as, uh, as varied the approaches are, as varied also yeah, our generations are here and, and, the, and the approach to uh, working uh, with uh, living systems. I see here uh, a common red thread about a, a, a really deep reflection of all of you, how we can uh, um, give uh, justice to uh, non-human organisms and actually microbiome, micro, the, the phenomenon of the microorganisms and the powerful uh, role that they play and actually the, uh, st uh, humans stepping back of the superpower, uh, seemingly superpower and influence that we can have and produce and coming actually now from the big criticism that we heard from Oran's talk uh, upon uh, the fetishization of biotechnology and the seemingly uh, superpower of what humans have to, to grow meat out of everything. And the, uh, what I find very interesting, uh, the, the high big cr criticism of metabolic rift technologies and the fetishization. And uh, also we, in a while, I, I will go back to the Rice Brewing Sisters who have some questions and I'll come back to you, uh, Oren, also about the, the fascination of the meta level of satire, what you this, this set up the installation that is probably was maybe not understood by all the audiences. And then I see also the, um, um, the, the, the realm and the whole world that you pay embraced, uh, as you told us in your talk today about, um, I could even call it viral performances, that all these years of artistic research in the different projects that you have been showing us and actually making and made way more projects, uh, that uh, there is actually, it seems the virus has gotten the role of a cyberpunk character, basically, and you actually play along with this. And I also come back to a question to you, but I actually would like to come back to our first speakers here, uh, to the Brewing Sisters, and also thank you for the whole journey the, uh, in, our, in, the, in our quite short panel today that you uh, took us to a journey also to show us the garden that you built up in South Korea. And we probably are all now curious to visit at some point. Uh, and um, I also found it interesting um, uh, dear sisters, when we can reflect upon your presentation, metabolic processes, and I found this very interesting. I think it concerns uh, you all speakers here in our panel, eh? um, the awareness of metabolic processes. And I, I saw that, that you would like to read it uh, directly biological and then also metaphorical metabolism. And uh, Soko Dung Dung coming to talk about the Berlin project. Maybe you can actually uh, give us more of an insight now. Um, I feel that I, I recall and I, I, it was echoing this fermenting feminist approach by Lauren Fournier. And I think you probably go very much into the direction of um, fermenting feminism as methodology and a metaphor. Uh, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I heard a lot of for Lauren Fournier's proposition that fermentation is a generative metaphor, a material practice and a microbiological process through which feminism might be re-energized. And I heard you well when you also said in the end of your talk, it's about female labor and it's also about um, feminist, uh, f feminine role and feminist roles. I found this very interesting, this uh, melding. And of course the mixing, and I noted elasticity. And I think this is a term that all your artistic practice with the Berlin project, but maybe also with the general artistic practice that you are, uh, um, um, that you're expressing and living is the, this term I found very interesting as a method, elasticity. So maybe do you want to maybe 
go a little bit more into this metabolic process, maybe in perspective of uh, the Berlin Terrestrial Celestial Project. You would be so kind to come here to our camera that we can actually embrace. Oh, you can use that microphone. Wonderful. Okay. Loaded question, Regine. Thank you. <laughs> I think all three of us can can kind of offer yeah. something. Um, okay. Come to me. Why don't you just join me here? We have the camera. We have the audience. So maybe I just hand over whoever wants to speak. <laughs> Sorry about the loaded question. I basically only wanted to find uh, a sort of a way in to actually continue talking about your Berlin project. I can start and I think maybe the other two sisters can can help me. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of layers, right? How we think of social fermentation as a way of decentering from humanist or anthropocentrist thought and how to pay attention to the microbiomic world. That was one layer. Um, another is fermentation or social fermentation as a feminist practice. Um, another being um, how we kind of incorporate this into a mode of elasticity um, and then in relation to the project in Berlin. So I, th I think we can kind of approach this question in multiple ways, but. But I can start with um, elasticity <laughs> because I think I brought this word, word up. Um, it is, it, it, in a way, um, I think our practice, let me start this way. I think our practice does focus on microbiomic world, fermentation as a biochemical process. But as much as we're interested in the non-human world, we're also interested in the human world because they, because both worlds inevitably have to interact. Um, one world can exploit another, another world can be exploited by another, but um, it, is, it is inevitably the two worlds that um, our practices speak to. And I think that's where the elasticity comes to, because the so, the, you might have seen that the social fermentation, that word um, reverberates differently to each member of the collective, so that there is a layer of kind of more human-centered, like discourse, conversations, struggles, fights, doing together, that comes into um, the practice that we eventually create as a collective. So um, how to approach the social fermentation, I thought we thought that, okay, it is. it comes from multiple scales, it comes from multiple humans, we deal with multiple microorganisms that some of which we just don't know where they come from. We don't know if you're gonna succeed in fermentation. We're really uncertain about this, but how can we think of this as not being uncertain, but being open-ended and kind of really living life in that moment of uncertainty and open-endedness. So I think that's where um, the term elasticity comes in, um, at least in my mind. I would be interested in hearing the other two sisters' thoughts too. Um, and then in, in this, I think this, this really directly ties into the project in Berlin, especially in Berlin, because it's our first time um, doing projects in Europe or Western Europe. And we encounter a lot of differences and I would say very charged differences, historical, racial, ethnic, gender differences um, working here. And um, the, how, how we incorporated this kind of uncertainty into our practice and eventually we ended up doing it without really knowing in advance what's going to happen is um, how we frame this um, fermentation process, especially coming from native practices in South Korea into something that builds resonance with the city that we staring, we were staying in and all of you are staying here. Um, and how we um, kind of thrive in this moment where we don't know what's going to happen because we use different ingredients, we use different terracottas, we don't know who we're collaborating with, where they come from, we only have certain level of collaboration and just being, being here for a month. Um, so a lot of it remains open-ended and I think I, I feel good about that. <laughs> um, just, just watching what happens and um, how it unfolds and I think that's why we are kind of not speaking about our work in the kind of a finalizing um, in a very linear way. Um, yeah, I hope that explains. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, just want to point out that um, when we, we traveled a lot 
um, we traveled to Southeast Asia mostly um, before pandemic. So we went to Taiwan or Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Philippines. Uh, we stayed there for a month at least and tried to learn um, how to make a uh, nuruk, like a uh, yeast, and also how to make a rice wine. So basically, whenever when when you have a rice or crops, then they are making alcohol with this kind of crop. So when we uh, visited um, certain area and a certain rice field, uh, we always met aunties, daughters, and uh, sisters. Um, I don't know why, but probably it makes sense that um, they have the knowledge that how to make uh, rice wine. So they travel, they, they pass on the secrets to their daughters and then sisters. So the Nari is kind of kept in their kind of sister, sisterhood. And we find it that's very uh, precious. And also that's really hidden and also being forgotten in Asian culture. And I think uh, we, we think um, we try to learn from aunties how they make uh, rice wine. Uh, whilst we are learning it, they told us a lot of story about their life and then they told a lot about um, belief system when they are making rice wine, which is quite poetic, but at the same time, very scientific as well. First of all, like don't touch any acid, um, acid acidic um, uh, fruits like lemon. So before, before making rice wine, um, try not to think of very uh, unpositive thinking, um, be very nice to, to, to your rice wine when you're making. So there are a lot of uh, belief system that is not really proven or maybe that it is kind of overlooked, which we find it very important. And we like to have that uh, culture and have that stories into our social fermentation practice. Maybe that's the one way we can think of as a feminist lens to our practice. Yeah. Three of us. <laughs> uh, we don't have to. We don't have to always talk in three. But um, I'll just do very shortly. In terms of metabolizing things, um, I think we, um, especially for Seokgo Dungdung, this project, it was really part of it was kind of us metabolizing this concept of indigeneity and this act of rice balls and mixing our organism to this yeast form and then putting it to the soil was also sort of a way of us sharing our germs and organisms to with the soil and i think that practice in a way is sort of an act of localizing in some way and we thought it was interesting to share that with people who have migrated to berlin and we wanted to share their stories and learn about their stories about how they um, adjusted to Berlin and how their gardening practice has affected the way um, with the seeds that they brought and how they adjusted to the soil and the climate here. Um, so we thought the fermentation practice and the social narratives um, and the people's choices and stories that come with it. Um, and in that way also we're planting memories, we're planting plants, we're eating food from it. Um, and we kind of want to bring a circle around that um, elements. So I think that's what we were trying to do. Thank you. And with these um, meldings, I have a question to you, Paying. So also this, the idea of melding and let the virus do its thing, and that you said you came from interest of uh, pathogens, but then you actually wanted to move on, which I find very interesting. But then all it's all, as I said already, I had this feeling, it seems like the, the virus got the role basically of a cyberpunk character and that in many different projects that you actually let the viral perform, which is also an interesting idea of autonomy as again, as a human um, unit steps back and um, also the ecosystem of uh, cuisine and uh, so so actually is it exactly this pathogenic character associated with viruses that makes it so seductive for you to use combining 
danger and fear of disease and death with food, beauty, and pleasure? Well, actually, not that much. Maybe in the beginning, like in the very, very beginning, like about 10 years ago, that was what attracts me. But gradually, as you mentioned, it has a role. Uh, the virus becomes sort of like a mirror. And in the mirror, in the sense of like, we are looking at the viruses and reflecting on ourselves. But I think this has uh, two traditions maybe in, on, my, on me, because I studied design where we look at objects uh, as artifacts and where artifacts create the world and influence ourselves on, the, on reverse. But also my Asian culture, which in the Chinese philosophy, it has a lot of things where you look at things and then you think about yourselves and you ponder on the same idea again and again and again, and then you discover some truth underneath it. So it's more focusing on that process instead of a definition of the thing. So I think virus, because it's so integrated with our life that like even with now here, right now on me, I must have some viruses on me. So this integration seems everything exists, every biological thing exists, it's always there. So it, it has a very rich element that we can ponder on. So it becomes a very nice subject, yeah. Again, the awareness how much virus is, is in us. We are the virus actually. And coming with this um, metabolic uh, change actually to, to you, Aaron. Um, uh, so actually, yeah, we, we, we live really in this age of soil crisis and, uh, and this mass soil degradation and the, the tandem with climate change and the threat to agricultural norms. So you were pointing out all these, these uh, wannabe projects from biotech companies that actually, uh, and then the sentience, the, 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 this, I think this shift was so important that you said, and we feel this with the biosophy with, in context of the um, discourse of post-anthropocentric uh, um, discussions that we have led at Art Literature for all these last few years, that's uh, giving sentience to non-humans, how much we can learn them. And then you actually here counter um, pr present or you actually you, you dissect these uh, biotech biotech projects, right, that, that promise the world, but then again, that, um, that sentience, the biological sen um, systems, instead of giving tribute to non-human sentience and, uh, and agency. Um, actually, I, I would be curious, Oron, if you could go um, and, um, and share with us more this, this the, the life of the work 3SDC and also actually the, the, the audience feedback and actually how, how, how this actually interacted all in all. I'm really, really curious because there's so much irony and satire in it actually. How, what's, what's the reaction to it? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you to, for giving me the opportunity to talk more about that project because it was a very interesting project. We, we from my perspective, obviously, uh, we, we framed it as a durational performative experiment. So very similar to the approach that you're taking. We had workshops there. We had uh, two dinners that uh, we organized with a, a local chef that specialize in indigenous food in Australia. And, and the brief I gave to the chef was uh, cook us something that uh, the contemporary agriculture and, more, and kind of future ag tech is trying to make us live without. Yeah, So food that is growing in soil, <laughs> being kind of a uh, uh, bath by the sun and uh, is kind of uh, running in shit, uh, but also in a sense food that is wild, that is seasonal, that is foraged, that kind of non-standardized food that nature is providing us as opposed to uh, this uh, technological approach. And he did an amazing dinner. It was we, we had two dinners of about 50 participants each. It was unbelievably tasty, but it cost $200 a person. So when I invited the people and the people who paid this money to come in, I, we, we had like a conversation to start with. And I said, okay, you know, on the one hand, this new agriculture is trying to promise uh, or is promising to feed the world, which I don't think is going to happen, cheaply and sustainably, which I, again, I don't think it's going to happen. But the alternative is what you are going to consume now, but it costs you $200, $200 each to eat it. So it's only privileged people can enjoy kind of the fruits of uninterrupted nature in this context. So we are in a problem. And, and I wanted them to, 
the way I presented it, I said like, okay, enjoy your food, but feel guilty while doing so. Because the other thing is that those new technologies are basically trying to create this notion of a guilt-free existence while we're consuming the world around us. So as long as we at least informed about the hypocrisy of us being in the world, it's one step towards trying to figure out where we're going. Yeah, so this idea of informed hypocrisy, I think is extremely important. And, and it seems that the people obviously enjoy the food very much and enjoy the idea of feeling guilty while eating the food. There's like this French, very French thing, I think that we were able to import to Australia. Um, but the other thing that we, we worked with a, a graphic designer, we designed the whole uh, exhibition in such a way that it would appear as if it's a, a serious tech uh, uh, operation, even though we had the, the compost and we had all of the other things. And, and, and if you look closely, you realize it's a, it's a useless cycle rather than it's going to do anything good in the world. And for the didactic panels for the works, what we did was to basically copy paste from those companies and then just try and push it a bit more further that people would recognize that it's a satire. But especially after being in DLD, I realized that we didn't even push it far enough. Those companies are a satire of themselves and raising millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in venture capital money by telling us those ridiculous stories. And venture capitalists love that seductive narrative that comes through. So yeah, we yet again, we failed. And, and I sent an engineer, actually an environmental engineer, which I knew I sent him on a mission, said, okay, have a look around the show and tell me where we got it wrong. And I wanted him to pick up all of those problems and, and pick up where we kind of really pushed it. And there's no way those promises are actually going to be fulfilled. And the only thing it could come up back to me was, he said, how did you manage to get uh, such sponsorship from this 3SDC company? He was just so captured by the fact that we designed a logo that looked like a logo of a company that he couldn't even think about anything else. And he again, thought that it's real. And then I had two visitors. One was um, looking after golf uh, loans in Australia, in Perth, which is one of the worst environmental polluters in, of the river uh, uh, in Perth. And uh, his partner who was, uh, an environmental scientist working for mining companies and re remediation of mining. And, and they were like the most amazingly thick people in the sense of not being able to, again, see the satire and understand the issues that they are supposed to be the people who actually it should be in the know. This guy didn't even know how much pollution his lawn is producing and how, how many kind of algae blooms we have in the river because of the type of stuff, because of people want to play golf. Yeah, it's, it's not even something that, uh, and the, uh, the one about the environmental remediation, she, she had no clue about the, the soil biome. You know, what kind of environmental remediation you can do in mining if you can't re rebuild the soil with the biome inside it and then claiming. So they're all kind of greenwashing and, and they left the show saying, best of luck, you know, hopefully you'll be able to commercialize your ideas. You know, that's kind of the world we live in. We're, we're totally fucked. <laughs> well, you leave this actually uh, to, to me here. Uh, okay. Uh, it's the conundrum of the world we're living. So we have maybe a comment, uh, questions from the audience. Yeah, does anybody want to ask a question from the audience first before we look online? Now we have just a quick question. I was thinking to ask uh, Oren in terms of why do we not want to eat animals? Is it really about the sentience? And my question is also related a little bit about science fiction because I'm very interested lately in how do we construct narratives and then how do we construct realities in art and biology? And there's like this story about Philip K. Dick uh, that, uh, about the wolf and he gains like his conscious, he has sentience even, and then they eat him anyway, right? So we're discussing what's the reason why we eat or not eat someone. And I was also thinking in terms of science fiction of Margaret Atwood and Oryx and Craig, and they also have like these chicken breast creatures, you know, and then the thing that you told us today, like we extract the parts that are not necessary from this. So I was thinking in terms of science fiction, but also in terms of why do we eat or do we want to eat creatures? All right, yeah, thanks for that. And obviously, you know, the idea of growing meat in the lab is a, a, a very kind of important trope in science fiction. There's a space merchant from the late 50s as well, they're talking about the little chicken, which is this big chunk of chicken meat that they keep on cutting. Uh, so, so I think there's a couple of things with the narrative around lab grown meat and growing animal products without animals. Uh, one is the idea of creating this guilt-free existence. And, and there's a really interesting philosophical critique about it because it's not solving the problem of how we relate to the world. If we create those technological solutions for those ethical issues, we're actually 
enhancing those ethical issues. We, we're not allowing, we were basically, you know, it's another form of a metabolic rift of the sense of the contract that we have with life around us. Um, we had a project back in the early 2000s called the DIY Devictimizer Kit, and that was to do with uh, something we noticed in Spain. And this is kind of a little story, but I think it tells a lot um, that what we noticed in Spain is that as the amount of McDonald's increased in Spain, so did the resistance to bullfighting. So this idea of replacing this very small scale, ritualistic and respectful, but very violent uh, relationship to uh, bovine, to cattle uh, in bullfighting with the much more large scale, massive, but totally obscured and implicit violence of, you know, fast food burgers. This is how our culture is moving towards because it's not about the removal of the victim, it's the removal of our perception of our vision of the victim from in front of us. So when you grow meat in the lab, you still use animal products. Uh, you still use fetal calf serum, but even if you get rid of it, there's so many other ingredients. And this is one of the things that those narratives are telling us. It's as if the lab and science and technology is kind of the, ma the magic of the 21st century where we can get something from nothing. So that's why I think the air protein is such a nice idea of, of the type of stories that are being told to us at the moment. And this idea that, you know, we can claim that bacteria is not sentient, but they're trying to hide the bacteria from, our, uh, from that story just to give us this amazing narrative of manna from heaven, of somehow science brings us food from nowhere. And um, at the very same time, yeah, we, we are kind of trying to push this idea of removing the sentiency from animals, but they're also that's not the top story. That's, I was really happy to see it from in the talk, in the TED talk that Isha gave, because usually they don't even talk about it, even though it's implied. They talk about kind of the environmental consequences. And again, this idea that somehow we can create our existence totally separated from nature. And this is kind of the, the metabolic rift technology that is being promoted more and more as, as a way to get out of the mess we're in. And, and it is science fiction. You know, those companies are selling us science fiction stories because those things are not real. You know, those companies are way better artists than any, uh, anyone here in the room. They're making the world so strange. But we are the collateral damage of the stories they tell investors, not the stories that are actually happening in the world. And, and we all believe those science fiction stories now that are all to do with just money changing hands and nothing to do with the reality you know, of our existence. Hello, and thank you so much, uh, Joanna. I'm here today. This is my name from New Zealand. Um, I'm really interested in uh, to hearing briefly from whoever of all the speakers uh, has enlightened <laughs> ideas. Um, from the Rice sisters, I heard several times just you dropped comments about the spiritual, but you didn't go further into that. And Pei Ying said um, the value of life is treated different, differently by different species. And then Oron said, uh, talked about the degrees of violence we are, with, we are willing to exercise towards other living beings. And in that, I was wondering whether we are so currently um, focusing on the technology, our existing existence in the world in terms of the biological, that we, we, we sort of treat the the cultural knowledge of spiritual, or there's many other words for that, but you know, the, the knowledge that is handed down that is embedded in mythology and spirituality and in Germany, which is not my place of origin, this is long gone, I think, anyhow, I'm not living here any longer. So I'm really curious to hear how those kind of influences also have a place in your practices. <laughs> not sure how I can answer this. <laughs> Um, but I do think uh, I can say what I know, I guess, um, from, I think, throughout her, our journey of three years, um, many aunties, and we met aunties, and then we met young people who are both fermenters, and we met farmers, um, and I, 
they told us this thing called pen, pantang, pantang, which is belief systems um, that are based on facts or sometimes based on beliefs. And there's things such as um, don't drink or eat anything sour before you ferment something. Um, have good thoughts when you ferment because if you have sad thoughts, well, the drink that you make will bring sad feelings on things like that. Um, and Anta, she was telling us a story like these things I don't believe, but I believe because if I don't believe, I don't really have a story to tell. Which we thought was an interesting um, way of how she expressed it. And and I think as we um, continued on our research on ferment fermentation culture or doing farming ourselves, um, there's there's a gap of what we know and what we trust choose to know. And um, and even with younger people who are using all these technologies, they they also told us they there's this gap where they just have to let go and trust the process. Um, so in, in those little snippets of experience, I think we also just doing farming and it's our first time. So we just have having to let go. Um, those are moments where we felt trust, but also trust in the people that we work with. Um, so, so spiritually, truality, it, this process of working um, as a group and working with the people and in the projects, um, it made us think about spirituality, but with no answers. <laughs> um, but the fact that we feel it in some way is interesting. Um, and yeah, when we also share different beliefs, so just kind of having the space to just talk about it and ask about it um, was a good process for us. Well, I, I guess I'm more in the side. I'm usually half in art, half in science, half Asian, half European, because I live in a European city right now. Uh, all these like differences and also trying to gain the non-human perspective. This perspective change sort of made me realize that one thing is that there are a lot of things that we are unable to explain right now. And it always has been like, it's like, if you have this line, this is the frontier of our knowledge, there's always something beyond. And what happens with this thing beyond is then everyone trying to make system out of it because if without that system you cannot know how you behave that maybe it's a human um, nature that you always want a system to explain something and I think that's where the spirituality comes into play but it's not always just one system I think I quite enjoy playing um, what kind of spiritual system will exist if we are already at that edge of the knowledge and then uh, as the person who made the thought experiment, you have different background, different uh, perspective, different stand and environment, and then you make a different system out of it. And that becomes really fun and sometimes gives you some interesting insights. Yeah. yeah just uh, very shortly. It's a really great question, and this is something that Janat and myself have been battling with for the last 20 odd years, almost 30 years, working with life as a medium for artistic expression. And not being spiritual or religious, we still believe that life is special. So how do you generate what we refer to as a form of secular vitalism, the understanding, the recognition that life is different from any other material around us, without resorting to metaphysical kind of argument, is in a sense the journey that we're going through, and it's still not resolved. And it's something that we it, it's just a, you know i don't think we'll ever resolve it but striving towards a form of uh, secular vitalism as a way of engaging with life and understanding that life is not like any other material that we are exploiting and extracting value from is the beginning thank you so much um you see this is the classical moment where we actually could plunge more into the discussion and just sit all down and actually discuss one hour and we have already more questions but the great thing is we structured the conference that we will tomorrow do the discussion box the panel box and we have taken a lot of notes and uh, what we 
do we just say to be continued all the thoughts and um Actually, I have some uh, final, and also, of, of course, please, uh, vir virtual audience, we will come to your questions and pick up the aspects that you were writing in the chat, and we will discuss this tomorrow, and also let you share our outcome of that with you. Um, but what I wanted to say for the for the end, basically, of our, um, I know I'm biased, but I say I'm interesting panel here, panel A, I wanted to... Actually, uh, maybe <laughs> just make a final statement and actually it, it uh, encompasses actually all your pro proposals and suggestions and methodologies and performances that you were quickly sharing with us today. But we could definitely say that um, so that the techno-utopianism that we were also hearing from uh, Oron um, today, um, which in a way is um, hypermodernism in a way, uh, tries to seduce us to ignore the crisis. And actually this is the crisis that you were indirectly or directly also uh, touching into the soul crisis, the, the crisis basically. And uh, instead believe that new technologies or the dreams thereof will save us. And I think we kind of deconstructed that today to critically think about that. So it's so different, basically, and I'm referring to Oran, from Ray Kurzweil and singularity promises, um, promises us immortality in a hyper-technological version of the early Soviet belief that science would make us immortal gods. Hmm. And the end, uh, we only got better embalming methods for the corpses of Soviet leaders. So... That is actually one of the statements of many, many statements we could give. So the time for the panel A is already over. I would say we all go over and now go over to the interesting point of metabolizing. In other words, eating, right? Which Oren told me yesterday is the most intimate thing we can do, actually, eating. So my part is to thank everyone here and uh, inside, outside, uh, virtual world. Thank you so much. Thank you speakers to uh, share your knowledge and your engaged wonderful project with us and i would say now we go over and uh, metabolize and eat <laughs>